Well, Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Um, Thanks for talking to me. Well, you are uh, the Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times, so of course uh, it's interesting for our audience here in Denmark to get some inside perspectives of how it's like to cover American affairs in the age of Trump. So let's start with that. How big a change has it been in Washington and the political environment of operating as a reporter in Washington after Trump uh, became president? It's a drastic change. I mean, I've been in Washington now through a number of presidents. This is like no other presidency. The main difference is the, um, the relentlessness of it and the unpredictability of it. Um, the president um, as this is often up um, at six, sometimes even earlier, tweeting. Um, and what and uh, often up till midnight, also tweeting. Mm. So it's a long day, and often the tweets have real policy in them. Sometimes they don't. We ignore those, but often they have their major decisions in those tweets, and so we have to view them as if they are major White House p pronouncements. Mm. In what way would you say that the way of operating as a reporter has changed for your colleagues at the New York Times? in terms of accessibility to the president compared to, for instance, President Obama? Well, I have to say, Trump, the Trump White House is fairly accessible. You wouldn't know it looking at Sarah Sanders' uh, you know, news briefings, but the president, oddly, as much as he um, criticizes the press and the New York Times, has been, has been uh, fairly available. Um, last year, the first year of his presidency, we had seven or eight interviews with him. We had nothing like that with Obama. So, and um, they're fairly accessible inside. The problem we have is that so much that happens is basically straight from Trump. So there's no policy process. It's very hard to talk to people oftentimes to find out, you know, where are you going on this issue or that, mm. because usually it comes out in a, in a decree from the president in a tweet. So that, that's, the, that's the, the difference. In the old days, you know, the other White Houses would have, if they were going to make a big decision on health care, there'd be briefings, they'd like, give you the background about why they did it, you know, it was all, you know, and, and, and you, would, you would sort of know what was happening. They would have surprise announcements too, but it's not, it was never like this, where President Obama would wake up at six in the morning and just denounce something, and we had no idea it was coming. Mm. That just never happened. You mentioned before, uh, that he criticizes the mm -hmm. president, he criticizes the New York Times, which he often refers to as failing New York Times, right. despite the fact that your readership is actually going up. Yes, it's the opposite. <laughs> but, uh, and thank God for that. Uh, but I'm wondering, Elizabeth, because it is unheard of that the American president is so strongly criticizing the press as this current president right. is. How do you see that? From well, the it's, we, all presidents have criticized the press. It's good politics for whoever's president. Uh, it, it works politically. This one is different because it's so personal, it's so, it's so unrelenting, and it's, um, it's so angry. You know, to call us the failing New York Times, to go after individual reporters the way he does. Uh, it's, it's Trump. It's, it's part of who he is. You know, he, he is, you know, he came out of, out of, he came into politics as a New York real estate guy. Right, and that was what he knew—the combative, in-your-face kind of negotiation style, uh, lashing out after your enemies, never, you know, never, uh, always respond. Uh, he learned that in New York, and he's carried that into the White House. It's just not—it's not what presidents have done before. So, it, you know, it's not—it um, works among his base. You know, the forty percent of the country that supports him, maybe it. It's, it's popular, you know, he still has not expanded beyond that 40%. I mean, 60% of the country is opposed to him. Mm. So, um, in terms of being a president who, after an election, unites the country, you know, reaches out to the people who didn't vote for him, tries to bring them in, um, he's done the opposite. Mm. He's continued the division and, in fact, exacerbated it. How big a problem do you see this as being in terms of his constant criticism of reporters? I mean, it hap we get criticism all the t we get criticism all the time from the left and the right, you know, from our readers. Um, I we just it's part of our job. I mean, I don't see it as oh stop criticizing us. I mean, we don't, you know, we, we take that as part of our job. Um, the enemy of the people is a problem. I think that's 
Um, that's sort of going into a, a realm that we haven't seen before. But criticizing us, fine. You know, um, what are we gonna, what are we gonna say? Don't criticize us. Mm. No, we're the press. Mm. That's part of that's part of being American. I'm but I mean, I do, I do think, in in terms of, I think what you're getting at in terms of going after us all the time is fake news. I do think that does have a corrosive effect. I do think that I mean, we're, the press has never been that popular in the United States. Um, well, we're still not popular, but I, I do think that it certainly works with his supporters. And I think that when there is so much in the press that is, um, that is uh, you know, tough on the Trump administration, it's one way of, of attacking back and undermining what we write is not real. Mm. I mean, that's the whole fake news thing. Although when Trump says fake news, don't forget what he means is, um, it's news he doesn't like. It's, yeah. It's real news. So. Yeah. I'm wondering, Elizabeth, because it seems the way I read President Trump's attack on the media that he's desperately trying to make reporters like you and me and your colleagues at the New York Times, a, you know, part of his enemy list, the ones he's fighting against in his communication. He's always using this enemy picture, somebody he's fighting against. Right. And he wants us to become part of the story instead of reporting right, the story. Right. How, how do you navigate that? Well, we, we, we tend to not respond to him, um, except in cases where he says something so inaccurate about the New York Times that we feel that when we have corporate communications respond out in New York. Um, if he makes, you know, makes false statements about our bottom line or, you know, corporate communication will just quietly set the record straight. Um, if he, he went after Maggie Haberman and Mike Schmidt recently mm -hmm. for a story they wrote and we, I think we tweeted out, we stand by the story. I mean, we don't, so we don't engage in a back and forth with the president. There's no, there's no point in doing that. We just point out when he is completely inaccurate about us, mm -hmm. you know, about uh, statements about the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, there's nothing to be gained by getting into an argument with the president. It's not, it's not, it's not what we do. You know, we're not the resistance, we're not the opposition. We're, we're covering um, the Trump administration. So that, that's how we handle it. How has that changed? He's been president for a little more than a year and a half now. You talked about before uh, the, how his Twitter habits is making you operate in longer hours right. sometimes and earlier hours also. But I'm wondering, based on what you guys have learned so far now and the experience of covering Trump, right. what kind of adjustments has been made so far in terms of the way you cover him, if there well, have been any? Well, we now have six White House correspondents. We used to have four. When I was covering the White House, we had two. That was back in George W. Bush days. Mm -hmm. um, so we have more White House correspondents because it's it's a, the the days are very long and right. we can't have somebody on for 18 hours. You know, um, we have now a larger staff in Washington when the Trump was elected. We had about 70, 60, 70 people in Washington, and we now have more than 100. So there's been a lot of hiring that's gone on. We um, we now have the the Washington bureau staff starting at 6 a.m. with a, a news uh, with a reporter and an editor. So. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, catch the tweets, you know, and write a story quickly if need be. Um, and we, we've always had a night editor in Washington, but now we have um, the night editor is often there till midnight or 2 a.m. So basically, we, we were virtually 24 hours just in Washington. Of course, we have the, the Times is a worldwide operation, so if we're not up, you know, at 2 a.m., there's Hong Kong and then there's London. So right, right. We, we pass on. <laughs> but the point is, there's a lot of the bureau is, is staffed close to 24 hours a day now. Mm. In terms of, uh, quite often there's this talk about all his tweets and sometimes yeah. you hear people making the argument then that you got to see through uh, besides his tweets and actually look into the policy and not so much whatever noise that the president right. is creating. When you're looking, when your colleagues and yourself are looking through all these tweets, this bomb daily bombardment right. of, uh, of tweets from the president, how do you distinguish between what is news and what is just Trump being Trump? Well, that's a good question. We have the debate and discussion most days. You know, he'll tweet early. Um, there'll be an email. I'm usually at home at 6 a.m. I'm not in the office. And there'll be an email exchange between um, the early morning editor and the day editor and me and maybe one the early morning reporter and maybe one of the White House reporters about what do you think? He said this before. Maybe there's a little bit of a, he's made a little bit of headway here in terms of news. So we debate, and then we usually 
we usually write something, or they, you know, yeah, Eileen yeah. Sullivan usually writes something. Yeah. Um, and it might be just a modest three or four hundred words, and we'll just let it sit on the web, and then we'll see during the course of the day if it needs, if there's other developments that can be become part of a larger story. Mm. So we cover the presidency seriously. It doesn't matter who's president. Um, you know, this is history, for better or worse, it's history. We also, and I understand people will say, all you're doing is covering the noise, you're just reacting to the tweets. I understand that, but we feel like, again, more times than not, we cover, we cover them unless it's, there's nothing new. We also do longer-term stories. We're not just doing the daily right, tweet right, report. Right. So we do stories about immigration, about health care, um, about, um, certainly about the Russia investigation. Um, about uh, the EPA the environment, about the Pentagon. So we cover the whole range of the Trump administration, and some of the stories are, you know, they're in depth. They're long looks at problems at the agencies. There, we've done many, 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 many uh, long stories about the Russia investigation. Um, um, some have won the Pulitzer Prize. So mm. we feel like, you know, we try to do short, medium, long. You know. Right. Where is this going? I mean, because that, that's the question everybody seems to uh, yeah. ask themselves right now is, where is this going, this battle between Trump and the media? Where do you see this going? Is I don't it, see it ending. I don't think, I mean, I think this is just, I think it's good politics for him. It keeps his base engaged. He's, you know, it's good to have an enemy. And um, so I, th I don't see it changing at all. I mean, I think it, it, it could get worse. In, in what ways? He could do more of it, you know. I think it, some of the rallies, they've gotten really ugly. Um, he gets the crowd riled up, and then they will turn on the reporters and shout at the reporters, you know. So, you know, we're concerned that something serious might happen, but, but at this point, um, I, I, get, I don't see it ending at all. Yeah, because I was about to ask you that, yeah. because already when I covered the 2016 campaign, mm -hmm. uh, both at the convention in Cleveland, also going to some of his rallies, for instance, I remember one of the very last ones he held in Virginia two days before Election Day. Already back then, the uh, the atmosphere was really intense in a negative way against uh, the American reporters there. And right. I remember me and one of my Danish colleagues that I was there with, we talked about that this was actually one of the few times where we were a little uncomfortable. Right operating as reporters, uh, despite the fact that we came from a small country that just were there to cover the biggest right. event in the world at that point. Is this something that worries you? Sure, that actually we are, we're, now we're, sending concerned, out we're concerned about it. And we, uh, you know, newsrooms across the country have increased security. We have as well. And we don't talk about the details, but certainly no. we have. And I know there's television reporters um, who are more recognizable than we are, who um, are not traveling with security. So um, it's just a fact of this new world we live in. Mm. Yeah. Finally here, Elizabeth, it, it's a little more than two months away from Election Day right. in 2018 with the midterms. And then we can move on to the next big, big election, right, right. 2020, where at least for now we are expecting President Trump to run for re-election. Mm -hmm. How are you planning to cover this? Uh, well, we have a politics editor in New York, so that person will be Pat Healy. So we've always had a separate politics editor from a Wash the Washington bureau chief, but so he, he will have a team of reporters covering um, covering the country, covering the candidates. We expect to be a large number of candidates. Washington will obviously have um, some reporters in the mix for that as well. So mm. we it's a huge operation. We cover. Um, we will cover most of the candidates. You know, we, I don't think we have the staff to cover 20 candidates on no, each no, side. No. But you know, you cover them. I mean, the, the field narrows down as you saw, mm. and then by the end, you've got a handful, and you've got people on those uh, candidates full time. Mm. Um, but we'll certainly, and we'll certainly cover the country. You know, in a way, this is the national staff does that, not Washington, who cover goes out in the country. And I think we'll certainly um, cover Trump supporters very. Closely, we already are doing that, but you know, different than we did in 2016. Yeah, because I was about to ask you that, yeah. based on also what we right. from our part uh, at Congress and what we learned in terms of also what took us by surprise mm -hmm. in how the 2016 election campaign evolved mm -hmm. in a rather unexpected way with Trump on one side and Bernie on the other side. Mm -hmm. Based on that also, is there going to be adjustments? And what kind of adjustments are you making in your coverage based on also what maybe took you by surprise if oh, there was anything? Oh, yeah. 
Um, I think again we're we're much more focused on covering the country. Right. You know what what people are actually saying on the campaign trail, and uh, you know we're aware of what happened last time. It happened to everybody, but we're aware that it happened to us, and so um, we already have more people out in the country, and I think there'll be um, again uh, less reliance on you know um, catching it off of television, more focus on on actually being being a, being there, and you know more. I think in-depth interviews with Trump supporters, you know, and they're they're a mixed bag. Trump supporters are not all; they're, they're they're more diverse than we thought, than we re realized. Final question, Elizabeth: uh, Is President Trump hurting the American press right now, or is he in some ways, which he probably don't intend to, actually strengthening it? Well, I think it's both. I mean, I think that. Uh, it is corrosive for him to say over and over again, fake news, fake news, fake news. And I think, again, he's preparing the ground for, you know, a, a report from the Mueller investigation. He's preparing the ground for, you know, perhaps a big loss in the House in the mid midterms. Um, so that's very corrosive and that's, that's damaging. But I also think that um, his presidency has, has reminded all of us in journalism why we're in journalism, you know, holding power to account. And you could say maybe we should have realized that in a bigger way before. Yes, but you know we now know why why we do this, and um, I mean that's good. And I also is there's a there's um, there's a tremendous interest and uh, demand for quality journalism that we've seen. Um, and, you know the truth matters. Facts matter. That is true. Okay. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for taking the thank time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.